So I'm really delighted um, to introduce uh, this event today. It's part of a, a kind of sub series that we have going on at the Council of Southeast Asian Studies here at Yale. I'm the chair of the Council of Southeast Asian Studies and um, we have a graduate student conference that's going on at the end of the semester on the theme of waters. And it's organized by a group of inter-Asia graduate students. Um, and so uh, Al Lim, who's here, and I were got, got talking about the idea of water in Southeast Asia in particular. So we decided that we would have sort of a side current, so to speak, leading up to that graduate student conference. Um, Al, if you don't mind, finding the URL to the conference, you might put it in the chat. I forgot to dig it up before now. Um, but that will um, be taking place at the end of the semester. And so then we have these evening events, um, which are in addition to our Council Brown Bag series, but these events are all circulating on this theme of waters. Um, so I'm delighted um, today to present uh, or to introduce my, my friend and colleague, Andrew Johnson, um, who will be talking about his new book, uh, Mekong Dreaming. And mm. rather than give an extended introduction, you know, Andrew has taught at Yale and US at Princeton. I've known Andrew since graduate studies at Cornell. I think his PhD is from around 2010. Um, <clears throat> but rather than the standard introduction, I, I wanna just read a single sentence from this book to give you a sense of it. Um, you're going to hear more about the, 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 the full topic of the book, but I just want to set the tone for this evening with this sentence. How to think about such moments when a glimpse into a higher plane reveals a garbled, incomprehensible message. Let me just read that sentence one more time. How to think about such moments when a glimpse into a higher plane reveals a garbled, incomprehensible message. It's a really profound passage in a book that's full of profound and very interesting reflections on the art of field work, about the encounters with the supernatural, the uncanny, um, the inexplicable, um, and a meditation along the banks of the Mekong, which is really quite a fascinating way to get us into our discussions about um, waters in Southeast Asia. And to take us, last week uh, we had a talk uh, in the Brown Bag series by Jim Scott about the Irrawaddy. Um, and so now we've moved to another important deltaic system and an important river in Southeast Asia. But here I think what's fascinating is we're taking it from the realm of the material and the social to the realm of the uncanny and how those intersect with the material and the social. So I won't say any more, but I want to turn it over uh, to my friend and colleague, Andrew Johnson, um, to take us on, on a little journey uh, with today's proceeding. So I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to Andrew. And he'll have a talk for, you know, a kind of standard le talk length the discussion of the book. And then after that, we'll um, have time for a question and answer period. And I'll moderate that when we get to that. So thank you, Andrew, and welcome. Thanks, thanks so much, Alan. Thanks, thanks, Eric, for that uh, introduction, and and thanks for everything. Um, thanks for inviting me here. It's a really, it's a pleasure to be speaking uh, to the, to CES at 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 Yale, and um, I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, I'd also like to introduce a friend of mine, uh, Vinay Gao Huang, uh, Vinay Gao Huang, who is is uh, there at the banks of the Mekong, and he's going to show some video. Um, of the river where, where we're uh, kind of what I'm gonna be talking about and some of the, so you can kind of see in real time this, uh, what's going on there uh, uh, as, as I talk about it. ก็เลยผมก็แนะนําเอ่อเอ่อวินัยเอ่อแล้วก็ถ้าถ้าถ้าจะใช้วิดีโอสําหรับเอ่อแม่น้ําแล้วก็ให้ทุกคนดูเอ
But no one understood the change in the river's quality as a good thing. Fishermen could see now fish rotting on the bottom and nets that normally hung in slow moving eddies in the flow became clogged with algae, Sarai Gai and Tai, Tao and Lao. This green mass could be sometimes be pounded and roasted into a sort of a Laotian version of nori, but whatever advantage this newly abundant food source had was offset by its damage to fishing gear. Nets and boat propellers became clogged and useless as thick green mats flowed through the river and choked off the flow. Further, even for unclogged nets, this clear water presented another kind of a problem. The kinds of nets that fishermen use, these thin filaments of blue polyester, rely on being invisible to fish in red, silty water. Hence the name, Luang Mong, a trick of the eye. Uh, these tricks, however, don't work in clear flow. In recent years, all in the Mekong are dealing with a radically different river, with different water, a different biota, and different techniques that one might use to deal with it. But this is not limited to the area that I'm going to be talking about today, the middle Mekong in between Thailand and Laos. Uh, elsewhere, one of the most significant hydrological events in the world simply failed to manifest as the annual backflow of the Mekong ceased. Now, normally what would happen is as the monsoons flow into the river, uh, the river turns back on itself, flowing upstream into the Tonle Sap Lake and filling, uh, filling the lake in the middle of Cambodia, which provides most of the protein and, and food resources for that country. But this year it didn't. For fishermen, this is exceptionally troubling. The Mekong provides most of the protein for Cambodia and is the heart of Laos and of the Isan, the Lao-speaking region in Thailand. And fisheries have crashed in recent years and with them entire ways of life. The reasons for all of these changes have to do with a complicated mixture of hydrology and geopolitics. We could think about it in this way if you wanted to. We could think about national priorities or economic agendas. We could think about the Mekong River Commission, a sort of multi-body international organization of Mekong states that uh, seeks to manage and profit from the river's flow. We could think about it in terms of national development, of natural resources shared between Thailand and Laos, but uh, resources that belong to this or to that nation. We could think about it as a potential political flashpoint between China and ASEAN. But that's not really what I do. I'm an anthropologist, and that means I sort of zoom in to ask what these changes mean in the lives of ordinary people. And what I want to argue here is that the crisis in the river affects people on multiple different levels. It's a crisis of ecology of hydrology, of economy, of family, of imagination, of religion. So here, if uh, one weakness that I think a lot of work on, on water and, and hydrology has is that it gets really open to metaphors. And so the metaphor I'm going to use is not quite flows and not quite streams of consciousness as this is entitled, but a net. So relations are revealed to be interlinked. In a mirror of the blue Luang Mong nets, New ecological, social, and spiritual realms are interwoven. It's a core contention here that meaningful distinctions between the ecological, the, econo the economic, the spiritual, the, the uh, 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 social are not really so evident. You might use the term ontological. Other people have used the term ontological to refer to a realm that encompasses all that exists within the world. But there's an important caveat to that idea. While all the ontological configurations are in flux, there's no point at which there's a harmonious stasis. There's no one ontology that one could equate with a kind of a culture or tradition, something that lasts unchanged over time. Such configurations are always changing. In a moment of ecological collapse, relations are even more in flux with catastrophic effects and all involved. Further, just as we have a net that its strands extend out into the Mekong's murky flow, the strands that make up a net often lead beyond the, the zones of apprehension. A bit like that passage that Eric uh, read from the, from the book, we, uh, we don't quite know where these strands lead, yet still we, we hope to follow them and to harness their potential. Tim Ingold has talked about these kinds of relations as a politics of dwelling. It's a way to rethink a binary between a sort of a static, agentive people and a reactive, passive nature. And to kind of break apart the assumption of fact that the idea of nature has. Nature, in contrast, is not the raw conditions out there to be perceived, apprehended and sort of utilized by an agentive person, 
but which we change and we are changed by this physical being with the material and biota with which we interact. Such a process of dwelling creates what Engel calls a sense of place. But here today, something has gone awry. As outside forces collapse inward upon the Mekong, and in most significantly of which hydropower and most significantly of which Chinese hydropower, which I'll talk about in a moment, this politics of dwelling becomes more fraught. Especially in recent years, hydropower projects, the expansion of highly destructive forms of fishing, fishing with bombs, fishing with agricultural pesticides or fishing with electricity, um, rapid economic and ecological change and an alteration of the local spirits of place have forever changed this notion of a sense of place as we have in Ingold and who's drawing of course from Heidegger. As I argue here, it's not an, a collapse that destroys placemaking entirely, but one which weaves into it threads of obfuscation and uncertainty, anxiety, the occult. So to zoom out for a moment, just to situate everybody and make sure that we're all talking about the same river here, the Mekong is one of the largest in the world by drainage. It's the kind of the aorta of Southeast Asia. It flows down from the Tibetan Plateau through a series of turbulent rapids through China, uh, then down forms the border between Laos and Burma, then between Thailand and Laos. Eventually it goes into the heart of Cambodia and flows out south of, of Saigon and Vietnam. It's a river split by political boundaries and carries with it a legacy of political conflicts and wars. But uh, what you're seeing today, and I can everybody see the video here, is, is that, um, can we put uh, Vinay's, Kun Vinay's video on? Um, oh yeah, okay. So this part of, <laughs> what do you have? <laughs> um, what you're seeing today, the river begins to flatten out after its turbulent beginnings. Stretches are still marked by rapids and waterfalls, but other reaches become broad. Sometimes this is just a result of the time of year. During the monsoon, the water level can jump up nine meters, turning what looks like a scrub forest into a broad expanse of water, and then back down to a trickle during the dry season. Large-scale alteration to the river has come slowly, or at least in comparison with many other river systems in the world. The Mekong region was not high priority for China, uh, being far from the centers of power in the middle Mekong area has been war-torn for hundreds of years. Uh, well, you know, American audiences might think of the Vietnam War, the Khmer Rouge, and these kinds of things. Uh, even in the 17 and 1800, cities such as Vientiane were sacked and burned in wars from uh, between Siam and, and Laos. But change has come and it's come very rapidly now. Beijing has resolved to do something about barriers to trade between China and, and areas further downstream. And as a result, they've been blasting rapids in the river, uh, trying to make the, the flow navigable by cargo ship. These alterations are happening upstream of uh, where Kunbina is right now, um, which itself is a little bit upstream from Vientiane, but the changes in the river are keenly felt. Specifically, this has to do with hydropower. The numbers of dams across the mainstream of the Mekong increases every year. Chinese and Lao advocates argue that these dams are necessary to produce clean power to fuel national development, although the real beneficiaries are likely to be those businesses involved in exporting in, uh, the power. There are 11 now in China across the mainstream of the river before it even flows into Southeast Asia, and especially the Nuozadu Dam has profound impacts on water downstream, effectively in 2019, completely stopping the pulse of the Mekong. At other times, the dams release water and leading to unexpected gouts of water that rush downstream, causing chaos to those living below. So in the wake of one of these floods in 2015, I followed one fisherman who I'm going to call Bong here. Um, he and I went down the river looking for one of the nets that had been swept away in the flood before. And as he guided us through the maze of rocks <clears throat> and islands washed clean of, uh, by the recent flood, we moved through clumps of bushes with branches bare, except for a very thin line of foliage marking the highest extent of the re recent water. These are shrubs that would ordinarily be submerged during the wet season then exposed during the dry season, leaf bear fruit and then be submerged again, uh, where the fish could come eat the, eat the fruit and then distribute the seeds and things like this. But a rise and fall of the river in the space of a week, as opposed to a year, gives very little time for such processes. 
the buds are smothered before they even have a chance to grow and fruit never appears. So as Bong steered me through a series of narrow channels, he related to me the multiple different fishing techniques that he used to use just a few years ago that no longer worked to catch catfish. The use of roadkill dog flesh uh, pickled in urine to catch the ca giant catfish's slightly smaller carnivorous cousin. The use of a drop of opium on large hooks for certain kinds of large fish. Certain incantations and spells, uh, Buddhist chants, that could coax a catfish to the net. A petition to the naga, a kind of a large water dragon that I'll talk ab about a little bit more today, uh, to guide fish towards him. A specific request to the lord of the fish, a spirit that ruled over and managed the local giant catfish to catch one of his subjects, finding a patch of very silty red water over in which nets could be hung invisible to passing fish. Bong points to a failure of technique across multiple levels. His own technologies for catching fish no longer work. And these are technologies that are not just material. We're not just talking about bait and nets and hooks and, other, and traps and other kinds of things here. But this is also a reading of the water, knowing where to put the nets, knowing uh, having the right kind of interpersonal relations with Nagas, with uh, the Lord of the Fish, with other kinds of, of powers on the river to hang his nets. Each of these, for Bong, are both part of the same process of dwelling. Each of these are interlinked, and each of these failed. So in my book here, uh, by the way, the islands, this island here that you can see uh, is... The tree is no longer there, but it's the one right behind Kunbinai uh, there. Anyway, you can see how the island has changed so over the years. Um, in the book, I look at the sense of loss and trace the links between hydropower and what we might call dwelling on the Mekong, charting the multiple factors that influence how one lives with the Change River. As I mentioned, Bong's fishing involves him knowing what particular fish would be active, what material bait would draw the fish to him, what traps to set for the fish, but also access, accessing some further means to ensure that the fish actually comes. Something from realms that we might call magical or religious and which I'm just going to call potential. We can think of it continuing with this metaphor of the net as using those lines that are partially or wholly obscured within the water and that which we need, we need new techniques to perceive. Indeed, while Bong described techniques that no longer work, he also described new ones that did. The recently arrived medium of Anaga, one who conducted spirit medium in a very different style from the traditional Laotian style spirit mediums along the, the, the river, uh, but rather dressed in a central Thai style, wore all the all white of an aesthetic, wore heavy wooden prayer beads. Um, indeed, this medium had answered his request one year and sent him two giant catfish just the day before he was supposed to entertain high ranking guests. So in the book, I look at the material qualities of the Mekong land and waterscape, including its temporality, the water itself, fish, and the changing techniques used to access them. And I go over these briefly today. In the book, I go into more detail, if you're interested in other things, I go into more detail about migrant labor, borders, the productive potential of foreign actors, including spirits, to play into this change. This in turn involves Mekong concepts of time as time and space become vital to how potential fish become actual fish and ultimately speaks towards dwelling in uncertain times. The Mekong itself is in constant motion in three directions. Its flow is hypnotic. It normally flows from west to east until the monsoons engorge it. And of course, down in Cambodia, then it switches back to flow east to west. Um, it flows up and down too. Whirlpools the size of a fist form on the surface with great sucking sounds, travel a few meters downstream and then dissipate. Plateaus of water bubble up from underneath. These are expected when the water flows over a great rock, but many are unpredictable. They form seemingly out of nowhere and disappear into the swirl. There's an endless churn in the red brown flow. For fishermen, the water is a constant topic of conversation. It can be little, nigh, or much lie. It runs either red with sediment or clear, meaning with a visibility of a few inches. Now clear has come to take a whole different meaning. At nights of the full moon, those living on its banks report fireballs erupting from its depths, at which they attribute to Nagas living within the river. The topography of the river is mediated by its rapid. Those rocks over, under, and around which the water flows. 
one navigates by reference to this or that rapid gang, which have names or stories. Some, like the great gang Pan, have personalities. And this latter rock, despite its reputation, which na the name means cruel, rapid, guards some of the best fishing in the area. A decade ago, the rapid tore the bottom out of a Chinese cargo vessel attempting to go over it, and cargo and oil floated downstream for days. Sometimes a rock is more than, sometimes a gang, a rapid is more than just a rock. A pocket of sand might grow into a beach when the water drops. Sometimes larger plants might colonize it and create an island, and around an island, it might make a long, lazy swirl, a place that's really good for fishing with a throw net or a place to fence off a part of the river to store live fish. In my field site too, there's a deep pool called, uh, called Nong, which is usually a word that's used for a uh, freshwater inland, uh, sorry, in a place away from the river, kind of a, a spring-fed pool. Here's where the water persists in the dry season, when the rest of the river drops down to a trickle, or when the water remains relatively still in the wet season, when the gang are raging. Here too is where the pabuk, the Mekong giant catfish, live. This is a fish that can get up to several hundred kilograms, about the size of a small cow. And from where the divine king, the lord of the fish, rules, a shrine to the lord stood stands just next to the village center above the swirling pool. The village traces its roots to the pool from a Laotian group from the former royal capital of Luang Prabang. They, at some unspecified point in time in the past centuries, traveled down to the Mekong River until they came here, and gazing down into the still clear water, they could see the forms of giant catfish swimming in the water and decided that this place was the dwelling of the Lord of the Fish. In the 1930s, this village entertained the Lord of Vientiane each year, who resided over the festivals, calling in the Lord of the Fish to possess the body of a medium and declare that catches of catfish would be plentiful that year, so long as everybody's morality had been upstanding. So the pool, which had formerly been off limits owing to its sacred status, is now a fishing site in recent years, since the fishing has, has cratered out, and nets still hang in the water today. My point in going over these, these different words and sort of description of the river itself means is that it, the topography of the river makes it a nest of distinct places. These are places that change depending on the time of year and house a variety of other than human beings and human activities. These create a social map marking off space, space that varies with the level of the water. But the division of the river into distinct places also delineates a political system of property ownership, revealing a legal grid that overlays the sort of hydrological grid and the ecological grid of the river. According to a mutual agreement of village heads from either side of the river, Certain places are designated as public or private, determining who has the right to fish where. These locations are also affixed to a particular feature, this eddy or that rapid or something like this. The richest fishermen might own the rights to fish at several sites, and fishing plots can be bought, sold, inherited, leased, just like land property could too. A good fishing site could go for several tens of thousands of baht before the dams came in, about 300 to $1,000. And if you didn't have one, you could still throw uh, fish with a throw net in a public entity, or you could stand on the edge of a boulder and try your luck with a precarious uh, dip net. So my point here is to say fishing in the river is bound within a net of relations that cross uh, international borders it, in excess and outside of a legal right to a particular zones in the river. And it's tied in with its hydrological features. There's public zones with the particular rules, private plots with their own system of tenure, and until recently, sacred spots with their own particular spirits associated with them. But these fishing sites are in the middle of an international boundary. Lao fishermen claim the Megong up to the point right to the Thai shore and suggested that they're simply being generous neighbors in allowing Thai nationals such as Bong upon its waters and allowing the system of Luang Mong to persist but this is ignored by all involved. Bong and others cross this line regularly on their boats without any kind of paperwork. When I press Bong on the competing legal definitions of what constitutes Lao or Thai places of the water, he simply responded, Bok Yeo. It doesn't, the nations aren't applicable here. So the hydrology of the river enables claims to plots of water that are recognized by no authority higher than the village headman and his Lao neighbor. These two authorities agree on who owns what fishing site at what time and are responsible for adjudicating disputes over them. Here too, the police 
certainly can't, uh, do not and cannot get involved. A Thai policeman would have questionable authority over property rights claimed by another country, not to mention midstream in this sort of gray zone. However, as I explore in the, in the book, such conflicts do indeed erupt with Laotian police, Thai military, Thai police and village heads, each pulling in their own different separate directions. So these system of property ownership and fishing rights constitute another way of seeing ownership and authority in the river tied to place. A way of seeing the river as shared space that has nothing to do with Bangkok or Vientiane, much less to do with Beijing, and cross river authority as ruled more by force of personality than legal mandate. But with changes in the water become, come multiple changes at the level of authority as well. Rapids, if not blasted, can become submerged in a flood or turn into full fledged islands uh, in, a, in an ebb. And the fisheries, these fisheries, have been some of the hardest hit by recent hydropower projects. When floods rip through the village, the most common casualty are those nets strung within the fishing grounds. The nets already prone to tangling become a pale blue mess as they are torn from the eddies in which they float. Most often they end up in the morning after the flood stranded on top of a boulder uh, with fish too ensnared to be removed rotting in the sun. And of these, most are swept away and too damaged to be recovered. This is the, the most of the, 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 the financial damage from a flood. Thus, of the sites that uh, Fong pointed out to me, many, if not most, were devoid of nets. Here, either nets have been swept away or equally as often, Fong described the, uh, the owners as waiting before they, they attempted any more fishing. Some had lost nets and were waiting for the money to kind of replace them and put them back in. Others were waiting for the algae bloom to subside, but some were simply waiting for the instability in the river to be over. Prices for fishing plots and the entire system of mutual ownership went into free fall and recriminations, sometimes village against village, sometimes Lao against Thai, and sometimes simply interpersonal, flared, even turning violent. Some, abandoning net fishing altogether, turned towards fishing with electric charges or bombs, and the Thai police inspector at the docks in turn began patrolling Laotian waters, armed and uh, drunk at times, firing at those he thought were fishing using these destructive techniques. Fishing, and by the extension, the realm managed by local authority is changing. The new landscape of potential is uncertain, and only after this new world emerges can decisions be made. So I've talked a little bit about, uh, I'm gonna move forward just a little bit. I've talked a little bit about the, the change in the pulse in the yearly pulse of the river. And what I wanna focus on is how this pulse marks time. And um, in that, as people decide when to lay the nets and when to use what particular techniques, they do so based upon a series of, of, of Buddhist festivals, which are then linked to the water's flood and its retreat. Uh, this also involves planting crops along the riverbank. As the water dies down, the, it leaves a thick silty deposit, which is really good for planting particular kinds of crop. Now, where the water rises and falls with, um, against uh, natural cycles, this becomes impossible to predict. So the new Mekong has a different time from the old one. And with it, what was once efficacious is no longer. If we were to reframe this statement in sort of theoretical terms, the Mekong becoming damned opens on to a new uncertain field of potentiality. And these rhythms, of course, uh, originate when the Chinese controller of the dam decides to retain or release water, decisions that are on principle not communicated downstream. Without the, communicate to, without the ability to communicate with the Chinese dam, fishermen can only watch the water level for indication that the dam controller has acted. They know very well the cause of the floods, but not whether or not one is coming and when it will. These are also changes to popular Buddhist practice. During the height of the dry season, normally, uh, sandy islands rise up out of the water as the water falls. And on these islands, villages from the Lao side and the Thai side come together and make a kind of a festival village where you can race tractors and drink beer and um, kind of engage in all the profits that low water fishing has. But in 2015, a glut of water came through and wiped out the village, um, causing tens of thousands of baht worth of damage and entirely disrupting the whole cycle of the whole uh, process of celebrations for the Buddhist New Year. So patterns of rise and fall are one strand in, in the way that one marks time in the Mekong. A yearly cyclical calendar punctuated by Buddhist holidays, fishing and farming practices, the monsoon. 
The dry season when you build festival villages and sandy islands emerge from the flow coincides with an abundance of fish and large fish are easy to catch in low water. These in turn fuel temple donations, uh, sacrifices to river beings and social events and ritual activities centered upon mobilizing villagers own potency. And around this time, uh, if anybody of you have been to Isan know, there's a rocket festival where large, very phallic rockets are fired up into the sky, triggering the monsoon. So in this way, rituals kind of gain the power to yield rain. When the water is near its height, in converse, other beings in turn act. This is the time when people see Naga fireballs. As Nagas come up and spit their own fire into the sky, then causing the clouds to disperse and the water to drop. So land beings act to break about the rise of the water. River beings act to bring about its ebb. The water, the base calendar that the Mekong mobilizes the potency of particular technologies. So the dam then alters time along the Mekong. Monsoon time and Buddhist time become disrupted via new modes of time when the gates open, when they shut. In the wake of the dam, the river and those within it become disentangled from the rhythms. The Mekong water level is no longer linked to the rain, which in turn is delinked to the ritual activity meant to provoke rain. Fish follow suit, and as the Naga show, so do river beings. So now in the wake of the new Mekong, this situated knowledge fails and new practices arise. Moratoriums on fishing in particular seasons and in particular sites have elapsed. And in response to falling yield, fishermen to compensate for the lack of knowledge of how to handle this new river, turn towards other fishing techniques. As fishermen no longer trap fish with old methods and as Naga fireballs, while they still appear, do not bring about a lowering of the water. And as high water comes with or without phallic rockets, river time is, becomes disentangled disentangled from Buddhist time, monsoon time, calendar time, events that were previously simultaneous are not any longer. So now is a different time in which to dwell for people, for fish, and for spirits as well. So as the story of the Lord of the Fish and the Naga indicate the disappearance of fish is not just about economy, rather it prevent, presents a fundamental religious problem as well. Sources of invisible potential on the river are not what they once were. Shrines to the Naga thought to exist within the water were at times declared to be shrines to dead Naga, where the spirits lived on even after the physical great serpents died owing to the river's change. As, uh, as one fisherman told me, Nagas used to come out of the river. They would come into town, put on human clothing, and come to the temple to listen to the Buddhist chanting. Sometimes they would even marry women from the village, and then they stopped. And so I asked him, I pressed him a little bit further, well, why did they stop? And he responded quite simply, they got tired of us. Elsewhere, other river beings underwent similar transformation. A Lao style medium, a very similar sort of religious professional who featured on the, in the, the rites surrounding the, the, the giant catfish 100 years ago, was the voice of an island king, a spirit that looked after the village and sent catches of fish to villagers' nets but found herself openly mocked after a 2015 possession ritual. Whereas a new male Bangkok style medium who lived an ascetic's life in a, in a cave behind the temple gained adherence. Old orders based around river and fish slip away to re replace by the representative of a new order and a new flow. Uh, significantly here, the flows of international migrant labor, the struggle to get a good work contract and to flow kind of outwards from the village. So the removal of religious figures from the physical realm, including the realm of kinship and participation in communal religious activity, also suggests a, a shift in notions of materiality. The physical Naga becomes a ghostly one, but a ghost that points not to the uncanny and not to haunting, but to the presence of new promises and new possibilities, even as another way of being declines. It's a shift that occurs as the workings of neoliberal capitalism multiply, as rubber prices rise and fall, as migrant labor becomes more tenuous and as the political future of the Northeast becomes more in doubt. But more than this, the natural world itself has changed as the formerly predictable Mekong, full of beings with which one had a kind of particular relationship becomes a new kind of a place. But even as all that is solid seems to melt into air, it does not disappear. As established economic and environmental orders fail and new miraculous or catastrophic horizons of possibility open up, new cosmological worlds are born. So through a micro examination of, of the impacts of Chinese hydropower on one small fishing community, I wanna show the scale of such changes. The collapse of the Mekong under new hydropower projects 
phrase alterations that can escape notice if we only think about the Mekong as a confluence of national interests. Bangkok, Beijing, and Vientiane might very well benefit from the alterations taking place in the river. Thailand invests its national interests in the capital in Bangkok, not necessarily in Isan and Mekong regions. And Laos has as one of its national priorities to become the battery of Asia. But for many that I discuss here, such changes involve multiple scales, including highly personal ones. The hydrology of the river changes, its color, its movement, even the way one marks space on the river changes. This is a very intimate alteration. Ways of marking both space and time, ways of dividing territory and dividing time are lost. Ways of relating to other inhabitants of the river, fish and spirits disappear to, re to be replaced by, as I described further elsewhere, new hybrids, new spirits, new sources of power, new sources of potential, ones that are more uncertain and ones that are more fraught. In short, as infrastructure itself alters the way the world works, new sources of potential, prosperous as well as disastrous, become revealed. That's all I have for my talk right now. I would like, to, I, I would, if I could ask, um, like to show a little bit more of the river as it is. So if you can all see, this is this is the stretch of, of river that I'm that I'm talking about there. Um, you've got areas of the bank that have been fortified by concrete. Over there is an island that I sort of feature on the cover of the book, but that tree is now gone. Um, and anyway, that's that's looking across the border into Laos right there. Can people see now? I, there was okay. just a shot where you, you see the same sun rising over there, but at a different time of day. <laughs> oh yeah, this is probably at about 5 a.m. or something like that. I think right now, this is now about nine. So with that, um, be happy to take questions or start discussion or... Um, Great, thank, thank you, Andrew. Um, so uh, I just wanna take a moment and give him some applause for a wonderful talk. So thank you. Um, now we're going to shift to the question and answer period and, and I will field the questions. Um, so if you have a question, um, you can either use the hand raise function on Zoom if you know how to use that. Um, if not, you can send a note to the chat um, to say that you have a question or even put it in there or raise your hand uh, wildly and I'll try and catch you in the video or something like that. I see that Paul Sarno has the first question. So go ahead, Paul. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, I think you said that there are 11 dams in China that affect the Mekong. Are there dams in Laos that affect the Mekong? And how- Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. There, there's, um, this number is, is constantly changing. And so in terms of dams across the main stream, Zayabri, there's one not too far upstream here. That's a bit a massive hydropower project that has that extends just across the mainstream of the river. Now it's not a very deep dam, it's not a high reservoir dam. Um, so the changes that it that it, it, it engenders are not, uh, it's not a, 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 a flood, you know, massive drying, massive flood. However, um, this clarity of the water, the, the algae bloom and the clarity of the water, the sort of taking the silt out of the water occurred after the Cybre was, was built. Um, so it still holds back a good deal of water and it's really responsible for a lot of the changes in the quality of the water. Um, I, however, during, during my field work, the Chinese dams being a kind of a higher reservoir, uh, dams are, are, have a different kind of an impact. So there's multiple different ones. Now, elsewhere in Laos, there's other proposed dams, including one just, a, you know, 20 minutes drive away from, from this spot right here. Um, quite close by, and there's an, a, a vast number of dams on tributaries that come in, including one just by Luang Prabang as well. Uh, there's a, a, a quick question. Uh, are the rocks in the, in the background natural or man-made? I think you can see one area where the village has decided to um, shore up the banks with concrete rocks. That was a response to the dams, in fact, because 
this irregular flow was not allowing the silt to fortify the banks themselves. You didn't get a nice kind of sandy slope on the side of the, of the, the river. And instead you had a constant flow that ate away at, at the bank and you had a lot of collapse. So what, what the, the village government did is they came and they, they fortified it with those rocks that you see right there. I think that's the extent of them. They, they stop up there and then they go back to the, the, the village center and a little ways down. If just beyond that, if you can see in the distance, there wouldn't be any rocks like that. Now there are big boulders elsewhere that I don't think are in frame here, um, which are natural, but those particular ones that were kind of guarded by a wire mesh are man-made. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, thank you uh, for that question and for, for the great um, reply, Andrew. Um, we have a, a question from Tuido. Um, uh, Tui, do you want to ans ask your question now? Uh, yes. <laughs> I'm not from Laos, I'm from Vietnam, but I live in, uh, in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam for like seven years and I work closely with the farmers. So I see like during the flood season, like during the flood season, I, I don't know how I'm yeah, you the correct word. So during the flood season, so like the, 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 the delta look like, like full of water. It look beautiful. When I am not from there originally, I'm from the southeast of, of Vietnam. So when I went there, lived there and I see it's beautiful. But then now they, they build the dye, the anti-flood dike. That um, Professor James Scott last, which some weeks ago, she, she said it's an engineer plus something, they build that dam to anti-flood. And it, 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 like, it changed the, the flow of the rivers. Yeah. So it damaged, it actually damaged like, the, the, the farms, the rice farms. In, in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam, like it's, we the end we are the end of the of the Mekong, so the the influence of the Mekong is significant. Yeah. Like when the, the Chinese debuted the dam, so the 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 fish not going down to the the Mekong de, in Viet, Delta in Vietnam anymore. But I'm not sure. So we didn't we, now we not not talking about fishing because it's, we cannot do anything with that. So now we, we raise fish a lot. We don't have natural fish from the, from the, from the river. But I'm not sure in Laos, like we, now we talk about how to prevent the influence of the dam for, for, for to influence of the dam to the, to the rice farm. Like the nutrition yeah. of the river is actually like during the flood season, it brings nutrition to the farms. Now it's not anymore. So is it yeah. like the same influence in Lao? So and oh, like uh, the research, like you yeah. see anything and then what the Laos government do with that, doing with that? We do a lot, but it's not actually do it. And I, the, 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 there's a lot to that, to that question. And, and I think, um, yes, it's the same process. Absolutely, because the, the silt that, that gets, you know, when the river comes in and it floods and it, it carries with it all the silt, if that, if that gets trapped behind a dam, I mean, first off, if you trap all the silt behind a dam, it decreases the efficiency of the dam, right? Because it clogs everything up and eventually over a short period of time, the dam stops producing uh, power in the way that it did when you first built it. So you trap all that silt back there, but so that's one reason why the silt doesn't get carried downstream, doesn't get deposited in the delta, and doesn't create fertilizer for, for rice farms. Also, with less flow, uh, in Vietnam, the problem is you have less flow, so salt water creeps in. And so you get a uh, problem of salt getting into rice fields, too, which is a tremendous issue. And that also makes has economic effects, too, in that uh, shrimp farms get more and more common and more and more profitable. Uh, which are require a lot more equipment and are owned by wealthier people. And so you get sort of a class economic problem there too. But in, in terms of, of what's going on in Laos, certainly um, the lack of, of silt and then efforts like those, like those um, rocks that you saw, that protects the banks from collapsing, but it also 
speeds the water on its way. And blasting rapids, as China has done further upstream, also speeds the water on its way too. So with you faster moving water, with less silt in it, the water then picks up less silt because it's not it's not really able to deposit that. And so any silt that it has gets jetted out into the into the sea and doesn't really get deposited. So it's a it's an entire change in the way the river goes. And Vietnam being at the very end of, of the, the system gets a lot of the effects, a lot of the downstream effects. I see a question on um, uh, from, uh, from from Carol and, and from, from Pat uh, that I I'd like to ask Kun Vi Nai, Nakap. Go me Kap Tam, Nakap Di Yogap, me Kun Geng Geng Rua, Beb, Legwa Lai Beb Rua Mankon, Le Rua, the me Kum Geng Geng Gan Rua Ti Menam Kong, the Kap. ที่เท่าๆๆแบบหม่องมีหรือเปล่านะครับเรือเรือเรือแข่งเหรอครับเรือนะเรือแบบแบบแบบการแข่งกันแบบเอ่อแข่งขันใช่ครับแข่งขัน
we used to do this. Now we don't do we don't do that anymore. There was when the dam came, everything changed, right? And so my question to you, is there really like a kind of metaphysical or you could say ontological, whatever word is appropriate, um, difference about time along the river? Um, or is it really just a variation of a kind of universal temporality? And, and what are your thoughts on that? And maybe we can't really decide it right now, but what are some of the ways in which you've thought about that problem? Um, and just I'll add to it, because even as we see your friend win there, um, I almost feel a visceral difference of temporality because I remember my own times along rivers, right? When you're at a river, you have a different kind of engagement with, with space time somehow, right? And so how do we deal with that like layered to the real time of history, not real time, but the, the temporality of history and then the temporality of an alternative temporality along a river? I mean, time is in perception, right? So time, time depends upon your apprehension of time and, and your, your experience of time and, and, and yeah, multiple different registers. And I think one, I start off the book in talking about um, the messianic and apocalyptic time time experiences. So when people talked about the, the dams, a lot of times, well, I start off with a dream that what a, um, uh, one of my interlocutors had about the dam breaking. And he, he dreamt that he saw a, 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 a gap in the dam and it was going to one day crack in half and flood and destroy the entire town. And so that also, that place is a particular marker in the future of what happens when these, what happens when these things fail or what happens when they succeed too much, what happens when we can no longer wait. Um, so there's this future point. And then of course, as you were saying, there's a sort of a past point too, that like before, before the dam came, it was like this. And there's also, I think this feeds into, there's a number of different registers that this feeds into. One is the kind of cult of development that is sort of endemic many, many places in the world, maybe every place in the world, but this idea that like, that things continually progress along a certain kind of a linear path towards more complexity or more development, or we get, I remember the year when we got electricity, I remember the year when the, um, when the road got paved, I remember the year, you know, the, these kinds of markers there. And so that projects in the future, a, a kind of an upward trajectory that can then be cast into doubt by, by intimations that, hey, there might be disaster actually at the end of this. And so there are these points, um, in various points in, in history, and especially in Isan, um, where you get this notion of messianic time comes in. There's a, a, a what is it? A millennial, millenarial group that, not, not the millennials, they're, they're, they're something, they're also apocalyptic, but there's something else. Um, but there's, there's a movement in the early 2000s, or the early 19, early 20th century, that was positing there, there would come a sort of a time when everything would change its shape. So animals would become demons, money would become excrement, um, and the only thing solid in the world would be lemongrass, since you would have to hold on to stalks of lemongrass to keep from being blown away by a giant wind that would sweep through the land. Um, also, there was the communist movement, which was uh, tremendously you know, based in the province, just very, very close to this area in which you know, people in, in this village and others up and down the Mekong had complicated relationships with. Uh, so, and, and of course, communism in the area also posited a time, a time free of imperialism, a time of revolution, the kind of constant revolution. So this constant deferment of disaster and hope off in the future marks another point at which there's a future point, there's a past point at which things were mythical, mystical, the Naga was still alive, and there you are caught somehow between these two points, and so you're waiting sort of for something to happen in between these two, the future point and the past point, you're, you're caught. Um, and I think, yeah, there is a certain, about the actual, you know, go to Gaston Bachelard or something like this, but to, but to talk about the, the time as that's the material, the, the time that's embedded within the material of the river, uh, that also has its own particular rhythms and its own particular, uh, uh, cycles beyond just the, the pulse of the Mekong. Um, but, you know, the way that time passes in a particular day, there's boats that come at night, which are the fish shockers, or maybe people running meth from across the border, which happens. 
um, something untoward happening in the middle of the night, or maybe it's just your friends coming back from a, a illicit pub in Laos, um, you know, really late. Then the chanting starts up around four or five in the morning, and then the the animals start, and then the traffic starts, and the morning boats start. And so there's a whole a whole auditory sensory perception that that informs you in a very bodily way about the passage of the time that is always connected to the river that's always linked to the that feeling of listening to what the river is doing or what people are doing on top of the river informs you of your sense of time of your sense of of the passage of time so between like the yeah the metaphysical the 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 apocalyptic messianic potentials in the future and then the kind of experience of of everyday passage of time too. I, I find I found time, temporality and time, and there's debates. Laura Bear's got these debates about, you know, we should really be saying time and not temporality. But the this notion of the uh, affective passage of time is something that I really um, it, it's always very striking, I, I think. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Al. Go ahead, Al. Yeah, so kind of related to this, um, something I took away from the book was this idea of ambivalence. So productive potential of maybe. Um, so you talk at, in the opening vignette about how there's a sense of ambivalence. And, and that to me was really interesting, just, just taking seriously that kind of ambivalence with what's in a, what we call a hauntological alternative. So I thought that was super interesting, but I'm wondering how you can, re how you reconcile that with a kind of, a kind of anthropology that's emerging in terms of praxis, like people who want to know who's complicit and kind of like, who are the stakeholders at work and kind of, um, a, a kind of politics of accountability. So how do you juggle the kind of ambivalence and, and accountability? Um, one, one is asking for kind of like taking seriously that murkiness, but the other is kind of murky, but people want to shine a light on it. How do you, how do you position yourself between these kind of um, holes in a sense? That's a good question. And, and that's also something that, I, that I, I think about a lot. And, you know, I'd like to say I, I, I do both, right? And, and that, that's like the right answer. But um, so, to explain why I do both. I mean, first off, I, I have some very practical and, and pragmatic um, uh, alliances that, that I think I, um, in, in, in the town where I work in, in that region, there's a number of NGOs that, that, that I, um, you know, I, I meet up with when I'm down there and, and sort of very practical, making sure that what I do doesn't damage the, the site where I work. And in fact, you know, I, I'm able to, to, help along the interests of the people with whom I work as much as I can. On the other hand, too, I mean, I, I'm personally coming from a, a very sort of deconstructive kind of anthropology where I think it's in reflexive. I think it's always vital to question your own assumptions when you're coming into a, 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 a fieldwork situation. So questioning the stakeholders and saying, okay, can we really chart out the right, you know, Ethic, the ethically right position, to, the politically right position to take, and then identify the stakeholders involved. I think uh, Marisol de la Cadena uh, talks a little bit about, about this and, and incorporating like non-human stakeholders within the thing, within within your sort of um, uh, pluriverse, as she says, within your 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 political unit. Um, that's good. That's I think that speaks towards taking other ways of seeing the world seriously. But on the uh, in addition to that. I think we also need to recognize, and this is really important to me, we need to see the, the other than human, the non-human as, uh, as our interlocutors see it or as, and, and not as like their culture or their ontology or something like that. But we, we are all in a way questioning, and myself included, uh, questioning what exists in the world and having real debates about what exists in the world. I remember having a, a, a talk with, with um, uh, uh, another fr a friend of mine from, from the same region, and um, a friend of mine, it, it, we we had been friends since 2014 or something like this, and he asked me, you know, do you, uh, do you believe in ghosts? And this is something that you know I get a lot. I write I write a lot about ghosts, and I'm very used to this question. And so I answered, you know, my uh, uh, which is the standard thing you're supposed to say. And he got angry with me. And he said, look, I asked you a question. I'm asking you sincerely. Um, 
And I realized that I'd been using that as a way of saying, okay, so this is what I'm interested in, what you believe in, 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 in your ideas. And now I'm, I'm standing on my other side and my anthropologist side, and I'm going to write this down. I'm going to say, okay, so this is Thai, you know, metaphysical reality, ontological reality, whatever you want to say. No, I wasn't being taken as that. I was being taken as a co-investigator in the world. And so what he said is, he says, you know, you've been around in many places. You are, you've studied a lot, you know, you must know something. So what do you know? And, and let's, let's compare. And I realized that he's asking to be taken seriously as a co-investigator of the world. And that I think as anthropologists, it's very important for us to do that, to recognize that our interlocutors are collaborators and not, e not just in the sense of like, oh, we're going to get together and you know, maybe try to give photo credit or co-author or something or, 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 or co-present something, but co-investigators into the kinds of questions we're asking. Nobody has a distinct answer. So who are the stakeholders? Is the Naga a stakeholder? I don't know. Nobody knows. Um, and I, I think answering that honestly is 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 one way of, of of getting of being sort of getting true to the heart of what the ethnography means to destabilize your own sense of surety about what exists and, and how the world works, which is what I think the point of anthropology is. So, I'll stop there. Co-researcher, yeah, 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 yeah. That that's Paul. Be, before I before I <laughs> let you ask your question, I wanted to just say one little thing. I wrote that word co-researcher because um, when you were speaking about um, co-investigator, um, Andrew, uh, it reminded me of a misreading that may be actually interesting because when I read your book, you used the term in, I think in the introduction somewhere, I can't remember what page, but the word co-researcher, which I just wrote in the chat for everyone. But when I, when I first read the word, and this is honest truth, I thought I'd never seen that word written like that before. And I thought that it meant core searcher. That's and and yeah. it, and the story that you're telling, and then I said, oh, actually he means co-researcher. But then I remember pausing thinking, well, actually what he's saying is that we're all in this together as searching for the core, right? Which is sort of what the story you just described with your your friend there. He he's like, no, we're co we're not just co-investigate, we're core searchers. And we're doing it together, looking for the core of human existence or something like that, you know, or something. And so I just wanted to do that play on words that was unintentional. But I know that Paul has a question, but you can respond to that real quick if you want. <clears throat> um, Paul, Paul, and then, then I'll get to William's question here. I, I was curious. I, I had the feeling that perhaps these fishermen and farmers on the Thai side must be complaining, at least to the regional Thai government, if not the central government, about what's happening. What does the central government or the regional government say to them? And I had the same question. I don't know if you know what the Lao fishermen and farmers are saying. That, that, that's, <laughs> my answer to that question would, would have been different two years ago. And um, I think... As a side anecdote, there was one um, uh, possession ritual, uh, sort of a, um, a, a spirit medium ritual that I was involved in where the, the people were asking the spirit medium to kind of stop the dams and get the spirits to stop the dams. And the spirit calls up the, the Laotian spirit on the, on, on the phone, on the, you know, uh, and to ask, to request a, a stop to the dam. And that, what the Laotian spirit says is, this is what is necessary for national development. And I think that would be the answer that you would get from the Lao government uh -huh. as well as the Lao spirit lord too. And I, I think that's no accident that the two are speaking in the same voice. Uh, on the Thai side, now the a lot of the electricity in Bangkok, I, I'm sure many of you have spent time there you have shopping malls that consume as much, individual shopping malls that consume as much electricity as an entire province. The province of Mehong Son is uses half as much electricity as the shopping mall of Siam Paragon. So Thailand has always been a center-oriented state. 
where resources are pulled to the center. There, uh, part of the pushback against the regime of Thaksin Shinawat was was a, a pushback against the sort of distribution of wealth a little bit outside of the center, even yeah. though it was going to his own projects. But the the drawing in of of resources to the center uh, has meant that the lives of of people on the outskirts don't get much play. However, recently, this year even, I think, uh, Thailand has formally complained to the Lao government and has intimated that it will not purchase electricity from uh, some of the new dams. Sayaburi, that, that has, it's, it's purchasing from, but there are some of the new dams there the Thai government has said it's not going to. I don't know why. I don't know what's behind that. It may be good intentions. It may be honorable intentions. I don't trust it, but maybe. Um, but there is, most, is an act. Oh, sorry. Is most of the electricity being sold to Thailand or to China? Yes. To, to Thai, the, the electricity generated in Laos is, is going to, to Thailand. Uh, further upstream, some of that may go to China. But mm. it's, even the Chinese dams right on the border, that's coming, that's being, that's, that's being sold for capital. Uh, uh, um, so William asks, I'm, uh, speaking of co-research, are you engaged in or thinking of engaging in multi-sided and extended project that incorporates other anthropologists working both up and downstream in China, Cambodia, and Vietnam? Um, William, are you in charge of a large grant-making project? Um, we could answer our, our own questions here. Not yet, sad face. Okay, well, let me know when you are and, and we'll talk. Um, but I think it, practically speaking, I would love to, I would actually love to get involved with um, uh, a fishery scientist too, because the, the, the actual, there has not been a lot of good fishery studies in the area, in, 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 on the Mekong River. Further down in Cambodia, there have been some, but the middle Mekong region, and especially as you go further up into Laos and China, um, the barriers to doing environmental field work are increased. Um, Laos famously, uh, some years ago, uh, environmental activists disappeared and, you know, presumably yeah. uh, make it interdisciplinary and add a geographer. Sure. Um, yes. Now let's, let's find grants, everyone. I think you've, 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 with it, with our modest uh, evening right here, we've created a, a Mekong studies uh, coalition. I mean, so I hope all of you can be in touch with each other. But it's, it's quite clear that the, the work is important. Um, I, I want to bring it to a close right now. It's, with our evening um, discussions, I try not to go too late just to make sure that we all don't get exhausted. Um, but if, there's a, if anyone has a final question they're really dying to ask, we can do that right now. Otherwise, um, we'll turn off their recorder and, and, um, uh, and bring the session to a close. Um, let me just see if there's any further question. And I do hope that folks will um, turn in, uh, tune, sorry, tune in uh, to, to some of the upcoming events, both in our Southeast Asia Council Brown Bag series um, and in our Side Eddy series on waters here. I will, I will draw your attention in particular to our, our talk in the Brown Bag next week it will be uh, Vince Raphael who will be giving a, a, a very provocatively titled talk called Duterte's Phallus. Uh, I don't have the full subtitle, but it's Aesthetics of Vulgarity in Duterte's Philippines. Um, so I think it'll be quite a great um, experience and I hope some of you can join us for that. Those talks are on Wednesdays at noon. Um, and then there's a few other series in, in, the, in the water series. And then at the end of the academic semester, there's the big graduate student conference. And, so I hope you can all tune in to some of these other events. Um, thanks everyone.